And, and you mentioned the economic problems, and, and certainly China has, has a long list, uh, been trying to make a, a transformation from the export-dependent manufacture, manufacturing uh, heavy system to something more oriented toward uh, domestic consumption. That's had sort of fitful, fitful progress, but not complete uh, success yet. How great is the danger that China ends up as many other developing countries have over time, stuck in what the World Bank has called the middle income trap, where you advance to a certain level uh, about where China is today, but never quite make the full leap to the level of uh, Japan, Europe, the United States? Well, that is indeed um, a, a key risk. Um, but if you look at um, you know some serious studies about how to avoid the middle income trap, two things are very important. One is infrastructure. Uh, this could be physical infrastructure, but I would actually expand that to include digital infrastructure for the modern age. And the second is human capital. Um, lots of countries get into the middle income clap because they can't um, have, they don't have sufficient uh, measures in both. Uh, China is not the case. Um, there, there is both human capital is improving uh, a bit. Too, you know, a fat, the, the diplomas have raced ahead of the economy, as we've seen uh, with the youth uh, education problems. Um, I really think that. Uh, uh, with and with China's innovation, really, the kind of um, uh, um, whether it's applications or the high tech that we have discussed, the the this, the kind of the way to escape the middle income trap is really there, but. What these studies do not take into account, the rising geopolitical uncertainties and macro uncertainties. This is really the first time that a large developing country has encountered such uh, external constraints. So that might be um, a key thing to watch. But just let me say, look, you know, the U.S. shock to China, OK, this U U.S. Uh, technology uh, investment restrictions is now becoming a new normal. The Chinese have accepted that. And how many more things can they really fight about? At some point, you know, we, we talk about balloons and then the, the list seems to be endless, but they're not. Uh, at some point, it's just going to become a new normal. And uh, I, uh, my prediction is that um, they will stabilize the relationships because the U.S. also does not want to have confrontation with China. And China will focus on its economy, but also developing a parallel technology system. And don't underestimate China's huge domestic innovation ecosystem. It's so important to have these um, uh, downstream players like the autonomous vehicle, EV, the, the clients be very close to upstream players like semiconductors. And that um, a loop, closed link loop, this huge demand, the proximity, the industrial supply chain is very, very critical for technological development. Just as we look at Japan, where the semiconductors rise was very much because of the rise of electronics uh, assist, uh, industry in Japan as well. And Japan is a closed economy. Now, China doesn't want that. To be very, very clear, China is open for business in the rest to the rest of the world, uh, embraces globalization. And by the way, half of China's export is in supply chain exports, OK, input trade. So imagine having China not participate as much in the global supply chain because of geopolitics. It would be absolutely disastrous to the whole world's economy.